In our worst run, we thought that by the year 2000, we would still have about 85% of the resources that we started with out here. It's only down to 85%. We didn't expect resource problems. We didn't expect other kinds of problems. Almost no pollution, actually. Here's pollution. Very, very little pollution uh, by 2000. So that's the second point, that we didn't expect problems in the first century. We expected them out here. Now, as soon as there's a peak, I ignore the curves. I don't know what will happen after the peak, but I do know that whatever happens, it will involve factors and relationships which are probably not in our model. So our model out here really doesn't tell you anything. I mean, you, sh you shouldn't look at it. Uh, it's just, you know, it's a, this is a, now an unknown. The main pressures, the main stress on human society isn't during this period. It's just in here when pressures are slowly rising to stop growth. That's when you'll see the big changes. Notice also that even out here, if you somehow think that this is a meaningful curve, which it isn't, you still have more people, more food, more industry than you had in 1900. So this is not a curve which predicts the elimination of humanity off the face of the earth. It simply says that we're above the limit and we have to come back down. And in this case, we do it through overshoot. Of course, we would like to try something else. But first, let's think, this is an abstract thing. In 1972, this is all I could show you. Now, the Daily Paper, I mean, here's a fantastic article in Die Zeit. Sind die Menschen noch zu retten? He doesn't answer the question, incidentally, but he shows a lot of reasons for asking the question. It's a fabulous article talking about the Stern Report, R72 work, Matas Wackernagel is here. This is a really great thing. And this is very common now. Actually, it didn't. If this had appeared 30 years ago, it would have caused a national scandal. Now, it's just one more newspaper article. Three weeks ago, a report said, if current trends continue, there won't be any more fish in the sea by 2048. The United Nations now says that in the middle of the century, seven billion people, which is the majority of the population, will be faced by water scarcity. And their definition of water scarcity is pretty strict. It doesn't mean that you turn on a tap and get low flow. It means you walk 10 miles for a bucket of dirty water. I mean, they have a very loose definition of water scarcity. Human beings in the natural world are on a collision course, signed by 1,600 scientists and 102 Nobel laureates. Three weeks ago, an extremely wealthy economist in the United States who makes his living putting together big financing packages for oil exploration, you know, he assembles two and three hundred million dollar packages so people can build new wells and so forth, stood up and said, maybe the global oil peak occurred last December. Maybe not. But if it didn't occur last December, it's going to be very soon. 36 countries worldwide face food shortages, according to the Food and Agricultural Organization. We know that the stratospheric ozone hole is bigger this year than ever before in human history, although we hope that it's in the process of turning around. I think maybe it will be. This is our success story in our book. Uh, and here's from the Stern Report, which says, if you ignore climate change, it will cause consequences like the Second World War. Really severe. So there are, I mean, scientists don't argue about this anymore. Now it has moved over to be a matter for economists and politicians and the public. Uh, why, you know, so what are the consequences of this? Well, let me talk about the big consequences and then I'll talk about the little consequences. The big consequence, think about the change which occurred in Germany between 1900 and 2000. You went from being a Kaiserreich to a democracy. You were had a relatively low material standard of living for the average person. Now you have a relatively high material standard of living. You were using 
horses, now you're using cars, I, on and on and on. Massive immigration waves, mainly from the Turks so far, joining the European Union, internet, all that stuff. Think about it. That's less change than you will see here in Germany in the next 25 years. What will you see? I'm not sure. It still depends on us. We still have the possibility to make choices which will influence what's going to happen here. But one of the common mistakes is to look at these problems and somehow imagine that they have to be solved within the current framework of government. No. There is going to be massive change. Some of it will be great, beautiful, and some of it will be awful, but we still have a chance to pick. The thing is, don't sit here imagining somehow that it's going to be sort of like this, except just a little bit different. It's going to be really different. Why? Well, we're moving into a period of capital scarcity. This is an algebraic curve. It's not an empirical curve. This is just calculated by algebra. But it shows a relationship which you find over and over and over again in the real world. I mean, I could show you many empirical examples of this, but I just want to have a simple message. This shows a very simple relationship. This is the ore grade, the concentration of ore, let's say copper, from 0% up to 12%. And this is the number of tons of waste that you have to process in order to get one ton of copper. The important things about this curve are the following. Initially, we start with the best stuff, the best copper, the best oil, the biggest, et cetera, best agricultural land. And then we start to grow and use it. And renewable resources, we deteriorate. Non-renewable resources, we use up. And slowly, we move down. But if you go from so at 12% ore grade, you need to process seven tons of waste for one ton of copper. And the amount of waste that you have to process is an indicator of the amount of capital and energy that you need to get the copper. Then it goes from down to six. It's actually not a big problem. Now you have to process 15 tons of waste to get one ton of copper, but this is no big problem. It doesn't require too much energy and waste. And now you go down here, let's say 3%. Now you need to process 32 tons of waste in order to get one ton of copper. It's still not a big problem. And then you come down in here, and suddenly it explodes. Now, technology can have some minor influence on the efficiency with which you process waste. But by and large, when you come down into this period, there's an explosive increase in your need for energy and material to continue obtaining the ores that you need. And we see this with minerals, with energy, agricultural sector, and so forth. And the consequences are the following. I'm sorry, there's a very complicated slide, but it's in the book. This is the heart of our model. We don't collapse in our model because you go out one morning and look down the hole and you are out of oil or you are out of copper. That's not what happens in our model. What happens is, as you use up your materials, the capital requirements go up. And eventually you, you lose the possibility for industrial growth. Let, let me show you how it works. Here's the main engine, the main motor for exponential growth in industrial output. Here's all the capital, steel mills, factories, robots, trucks, some of the roads that you use, electricity lines, all the stuff you need to make stuff. Capital gives you output. Output can be used in five ways, but a key way is investment. More capital gives more output, gives more investment, gives more capital. As long as you can sustain investment above depreciation, you have growth. And we've done that, by and large, for the last 150 years. 
and many people have come to expect that it's automatic and inevitable. It isn't. It's also possible less capital, less output, less output, less investment means you have even less capital in the future. You wouldn't notice it right away because this stuff lasts for 20 years or more and we don't measure it directly anyway. We use financial indicators, which are a little ambiguous, and the people who generate and tell you about the financial indicators have a very strong incentive